mysterious Mr. Melchizedek. One of the most mysterious people in all the Bible. There are so many different theories about who Melchizedek is. Some people say he's just a regular man named Melchizedek. Some people say he was an angel. Some people say he is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Some people say he was Shem. And there's even more deep and stranger theories about who he is. So what we're going to do in this is examine the most deep and stranger theories about who Melchizedek is. Maybe we'll come to a conclusion about who he is, maybe we won't. But I hope you'll stick around to the end because... The further we go, the stranger it will get. And this is deep and secret things. But let's look at all the theories. Theory number one, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Is Melchizedek a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus? Hebrews 7, 1 and 2 says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So Melchizedek and Jesus Christ are both priests. That's one similarity. Hebrews 6.20 says, Whether the forerunner is for us entered even Jesus, made an high priest after the, ever after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 8, 1, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Hebrews 7, 24 through 26, But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. So the Lord Jesus Christ is that high priest who's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And Melchizedek is a priest. So they're both priests. The next thing, they're both king of righteousness. Melchizedek is called king of righteousness. Jesus Christ is also called king of righteousness. Jeremiah 23, 5 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Isaiah 32, 1, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. Jesus is that king of righteousness. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. He's going to rule in righteousness. In Hebrews 7, 2, Melchizedek is called king of peace. Jesus is also that. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. They're both king of righteousness. They're both king of peace. Hebrews 7, 3, Without father, Without mother, this is talking about Melchizedek in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 3. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Although Jesus Christ became flesh by Mary, when it comes to his godhood, he is without mother. When it comes to his godhood, he doesn't have father or mother. He doesn't have a beginning or an ending. He does not have an earthly father or mother in that sense. He is the Son of God. But in the sense of his Godhood, he, did, he, would, he never had a beginning. And he never has an ending. You know, in the sense of his Godhood, Mary is not the mother of God. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. And Jesus himself said in Revelation twenty two thirteen, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus didn't just begin one day in a manger. He's always been here and he always will be here. He's always 
been God. Jesus Christ is God. Believing in the deity of Christ is a fundamental to the Christian faith. You have to believe that to be a Christian. And Jesus himself said in John eight fifty eight, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And Melchizedek is said to be made like unto the Son of God. That's where it gets tricky for this theory because Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Although it could be like John wrote it in Revelation. In Revelation 14, 14, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man. So in Hebrews, it says Melchizedek is made like unto the Son of God. So does that mean he's just like him and that he's not the Son of God? You know, that's where it gets tricky with this theory. Maybe it's just written like it's wrote in Revelation 14, 14. But it says in Hebrews 7, 4, Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. In Matthew 12, 41 through 42, Jesus declares himself as greater than Jonas and Solomon. Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. As is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said before Abraham was, I am. And Abraham t paid tithes to Melchizedek. Second Peter 2.11 shows that angels are greater in power than us. And Jesus Christ created the angels. So consider how great Jesus is. In Hebrews 7, 5 and 6, And verily they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Melchizedek's descent is not counted from the Levites. His priesthood was way before Aaron and superior and this is why Jesus Christ's priesthood is compared to Melchizedek's priesthood and not Aaron's. It was a, it's a better priesthood. Now that's the theory that he could be a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's probably the most common one. And I don't have a problem with it whatsoever. Do I know for certain that's what it is? I have no idea. But that's a good theory. Now, the next one gets a little stranger. And each one of these get a little bit more strange, in my opinion. Theory number two. Melchizedek is actually Shem. As you probably know, Shem is one of Noah's sons. So, Shem would have been on the ark. You know that. He would have seen it rain for the first time. Because before the flood, you know, it didn't rain. There was a mist that went up from the ground. Also, he would have seen the sons of God mix with the daughters of men. He would have seen some incredible things. The things that Shem saw were just incredible. The things that he saw. Probably more incredible than, than anybody, any other person. Because he lived so long in such crazy times. In Genesis 5.32 it says, And Noah was 500 years old. And Noah begat Shem... Ham, and Japheth. You know the story of how Noah gets drunk in his tent and he curses Canaan. But he said something else about Shem. When he's cursing Canaan, he says something else about Shem. In Genesis 9.26 it says, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. When Noah got off the ark, the Lord crowned Noah as king over the kingdom of heaven. That's before he gets drunk. In Genesis 9-1, when Noah's getting off the ark, it says, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fowl of the air, upon all that moveth upon the earth, and upon all the fishes of the sea, and to your hand are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb, have I given you all things? What you have in Genesis 9.26 is 
is Noah passing that crown that he just received in Genesis 9, the crown of the kingdom of heaven. He's passing it over to Shem when he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. You see, Noah was given the crown in Genesis 9 when he got off the ark. He's crowned king over the kingdom of heaven. The Lord crowns him just like he had crowned Adam back at the beginning of Genesis when he gave Adam dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. And now after Noah gets drunk, he passes the crown onto Shem and he curses Canaan. Now something you need to note is just how long Shem was alive after the flood. And this is what's really going to blow your mind. So you have Shem getting on the ark after seeing the sons of God mixed with the daughters of men, after seeing it rain for the first time, seeing no telling who knows what going on before he got on the ark. And now look how long he lives after he gets off of the ark. In Genesis eleven ten and 11, it says, These are the generations of Shem. Shem was an hundred years old and begat Arphaxad two years after the flood. And Shem lived after he begat Arphaxad five hundred years and begat sons and daughters. So if Shem begat Arphaxad two years after the flood and, lived, and then lived another five hundred years after he begat Arphaxad, Shem was around a long time after the flood. Over 500 years after the flood. That's incredible. So what you have is Shem being alive for most of Abraham's life. So it's not far-fetched that to believe Shem is Melchizedek. Because Shem is alive during the time of Abraham. Melchizedek is alive during the time of Abraham. Now see what Melchizedek says when he approaches Abraham. And also remember that Shem is still alive at this time. And he's still been crowned as king over the kingdom of heaven. Also remember the kingdom of heaven has nothing to do with, with the third heaven. It has to do with a physical place on the earth. And it is, it's not the third heaven like many people think. But remember how Noah said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. When the kingdom was passed on to Shem. Shem is still alive when Abraham is alive. And now look what Melchizedek says to Abraham. In Genesis 14, 18 through 20, he says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. What you have here is, I believe, Melchizedek is passing the kingdom of heaven on to Abraham. Notice he said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God. Just like Noah said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem. Melchizedek says, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. God was giving Abraham and his seed the kingdom of heaven. And Shem was passing it on, or Melchizedek was passing it on to him. So this theory teaches that in Hebrews 7, it is referring to the priesthood of Melchizedek and not to Melchizedek himself. You have to, if you go by this theory, then you make in Hebrews 7 that it's actually referring to the priesthood and not to Melchizedek himself. So, for example, in Hebrews 7, Three, where it says, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. You have to make all this be of referring to the priesthood and not Melchizedek himself. And that's where, I don't know if you can do that or not. Or this theory looks pretty good. I mean, maybe I'm missing something and you, you can do that somehow. But to me, it looks like in Hebrews 7, it's referring to Melchizedek, the person, not just to his priesthood. Or this theory looks pretty good that Melchizedek could be Shem, and Melchizedek is his priestly name. But Hebrews 7, 4 says, Now consider how great this man was. 
unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. So is Hebrews 7 just referring to the, his priesthood, or is it referring to Melchizedek himself? It's re if it's referring to Melchizedek himself, then there's some things in Hebrews 7 that wouldn't match Shem. So that's the problem you run into with that theory. But that's just, you know, that's my opinion. Maybe I'm missing something there. I'm open to correction. So that was the theory for the Lord Jesus is Shem, or is Melchizedek the Lord Jesus Christ. Theory number two is Melchizedek Shem. Now number three, this is even stranger. It's even way more strange than the other two. Theory number three is Melchizedek was a child of Adam and Eve before the fall. And this is a fascinating theory. Uh, but he's made like unto the Son of God. It says he was made like unto the Son of God. Hebrews 7, 3, Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So, the theory states that Melchizedek is only like the Son of God, but not the Son of God. So those who teach it wouldn't label him an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ at all. The next thing, it says in Hebrews 7, 3, that Melchizedek abideth a priest continually. So he's still presently serving as a priest somewhere. Another thing, they point out he's of another tribe. Hebrews 7, 13, for he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. So all Israel's twelve tribes stood before the brazen altar, according to Numbers 7, 10 through 11. So Melchizedek's tribe wasn't one of the twelve. In Numbers 7, 10 through 11, it says, And the princes offered for dedicating at the altar in the day that it was anointed, even the princes offered their offering before the altar. And the Lord said unto Moses, they shall offer their offering each prince on his day for the dedicating of the altar. So all Israel's 12 tribes stood before the brazen altar. But Melchizedek pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. If Melchizedek had a perfect priesthood, then he had a priesthood for a different kind of people. That's not connected with fallen Adam. So the Lord considers Salem, because Melchizedek is king of Salem, the Lord considers Salem as another tribe. Melchizedek would be king of Salem, of, a, of the, another tribe. Hebrews 7, 3, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. This theory believes Melchizedek has a descent, and that it simply says without descent, because his descent isn't specifically given. Also, this theory believes he has a descent because we know it isn't from Levi. And Hebrews 7, 6 says, but he whose descent is not counted from them. So he whose descent, the fact that it says in Hebrews 7, 6, he whose descent would prove he does have a descent. It's just not given. Those who believe this theory would also say this proves it is not the Lord Jesus Christ because we see Jesus Christ concerning the flesh is the seed of David and the son of Mary concerning the flesh. He's the son of Mary. And of course, he is the Son of God. So they say you can't say it's Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ has a descent because concerning the flesh, he's seed of David. Concerning the flesh, he's son of Mary. And he is Son of God. In Hebrews 7, 3, Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So having neither beginning of days nor end of life, neither neither end of life. So his beginning isn't recorded in Scripture. This theory would say his his beginning is not recorded, his descent's not recorded. 
And if Melchizedek was born before the fall, he may have never sinned and suffered death. And he's made like unto the Son of God. So this theory believes that he isn't Jesus Christ. He's just like the Son of God. Also that if he were Jesus, then why does it say that Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek? The theory states that if Melchizedek is Jesus, then why does it say Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek? But Melchizedek abideth a priest continually. If Melchizedek never died, then he's still serving as priest. And he pertaineth to another tribe in Hebrews 7, as it says in Hebrews 7, 13. So the theory is that Melchizedek is the firstborn of Adam and Eve, born before they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So therefore he wouldn't have the corrupt nature passed down to him because he was born before the fall. And then he ate from the tree of life and lives forever. He doesn't physically die because he never got the corrupt nature and he he doesn't and he just lives forever because he ate off the tree of life. In Genesis 3:20 Eve is called the mother of all living. Even though Cain and Abel hadn't been born yet. Consider that in Genesis 3:20 Eve is called the mother of all living even though Cain and Abel had not been born yet. In Genesis 3, 14, it says, And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And this is before Cain and Abel. Also take note that living conditions changed for Adam. After the fall, living conditions changed for Adam. Take note of this. Not only did the living conditions change for Adam after the fall, the living conditions changed for the serpent after the fall. Adam worked with no sweat before the fall. He enjoyed work. He didn't he didn't sweat before the fall. Before the fall, the serpent didn't crawl on his belly. So you see there was consequences after the fall. After the fall, Adam had to sweat for food. After the fall, the serpent crawled on his belly. Those were the Two consequences, two of the consequences that God gave. So it makes sense that Eve, before the fall, experienced painless childbirth before the fall. Since living conditions changed for Adam and the serpent, it would seem that they did for Eve as well, and she would have experienced painless childbirth before the fall. And after the fall, as you know, she has to bring forth children in sorrow. That was her con one of her consequences. She must bring forth her children in sorrow. So, she would have, if she didn't have any children before the fall, she would have never even experienced the painless childbirth. She would have never uh, suffered the different living conditions like Adam and the serpent, serpent did. Also take note that God told them to be fruitful and multiply before the fall. In Genesis 1.28, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So, God told them to be fruitful and multiply before the fall. 
and Eve would have experienced painless childbirth before the fall because one of the consequences is of her, of the fall is her having children and it's going to be painful. So that consequence really doesn't wouldn't seem as bad if she hadn't have already had children painlessly before the fall. So that's the theory that Melchizedek is a a child that was born before the fall to Adam and Eve. Melchizedek would have everlasting spiritual life because he obeyed God's command of not eating off the tree of knowledge of good and evil and everlasting physical life because he ate off the tree of life. And remember that um, they put a cherubim to guard the way of the tree after Adam and Eve sinned so that Adam wouldn't partake of it and live forever in his sinful state. So what if Melchizedek, born before the fall, never ate off the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but did partake of that tree of life? He would have everlasting spiritual life because he obeyed God's command of not eating off the tree he wasn't supposed to, and everlasting physical life because he ate off the tree of life. You know, this is just a theory. Very strange very thought-provoking. All these theories are very fascinating. This is Mr. Mysterious Melchizedek. Some people say he's just a regular man called Melchizedek. Some people say he was an angel. But these are the three most fascinating theories to me. Maybe you have another theory about who he is that could line up better with it. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I have no idea who he is. Maybe one of these theories are right. Uh, I don't think that I'll ever know. It's just very deep. It's the deep and secret things. But this has been Mr. Mysterious Melchizedek.